All right, so today we are going to be going over ground and air ambulance operations. I have actually have two separate lectures that I'll be going over. This one is going to be more entailing the Sanders version, what's some more of the more testable type material. And the second one is going to be more of a landing zone and operations based class. They're both relatively important. They both have good points and they both have testable points. So that being said, this will be a two part or so lecture uh, and the one in class as far as the ambulance operations, the second one, or sorry, the landing zone operations, that will be a little bit more interactive in class. But for now, we'll go ahead and start with this and kind of go over some of the backgrounds. Chapter two, ground and air ambulance operations. Open started back in 1968, National Academy of Science and National Research Council recommended designs covering size, shape, color, electrical systems, emergency equipment. So we're not no, so we're no longer driving around hearses or whatever else ragtag things we can go that we're going to be doing patient transport in. Then of course there's NFPA, which does has a little bit of input as well, and it all everything goes. So some of the specifications that they first came out with and we kind of, we still see today is basically the four main types of ambulance have our type one, two, three, and four. One, there's, you don't see very many of these in Vegas. It's, there's actually a separation between the box in the back and the front. Sometimes there is a connector in between the two. Usually sometimes it's a window. Other times there's a full walkthrough. I do believe community has one and or has a couple of these as those gems, but we don't see them a ton. Type two ambulances being a full ambulance type. Uh, see them in ILS a lot, and the Eurovans should be considered type two as well, because they have no box and it's a unibody type design. Type three ambulance is what you see the majority of time in Las Vegas, as far as private ambulance goes, as well as places like City. Uh, and then type four, the big rescues, that you count, City sells a couple, County, that's all they drive, Henderson drives those. And they're just very heavy duty, ton of extra things. Can be you can put a lot more gear in there and other things that can be decent for if you're running a rescue. Uh, one nice thing that a lot of type ones do have that you'll see many times. Many of those are more four wheel drive. Sometimes you'll see an extra cab on them, like critical care units will run with those. So there's a number of interesting ways that different areas use them, and it's kind of just what your district needs and your populace. And yeah, there's a few other ones you'll see. We'll talk about, I don't know if I have some in here, but we'll find some that are pretty interesting that you can see some agencies did some pretty interesting things. So something else that we'll see, some of the national standards. Once again, NFPA kind of took, because EMS has so much to do with fire, NFPA started having there, which is the National Fire Protection Association. They tend to have a lot of things going on there. Uh, and a lot of safety regulations that they bring into it. So between the Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services and NFPA, they eventually got together and came up with the conglomeration of what we have today and everything that's needed there. So, if you know, at the beginning shifts, make sure we're checking all of our gear. Even if it has a tag on there, technically, it's still on you. You can say all you want that a piece of gear, it was not in there, but it should have been. It was tagged by supply, whatever else. But if you didn't check, it is on you. Coming from someone who's had the continual hanging, went to go start my IV or my intubation, go to, to get my blade working, lights out, battery's dead, and trying to, and even if not much I can do because that equipment malfunction at the time, you still feel really, really crappy about it because now you're providing subpar care because you didn't necessarily check out your gear. Sometimes it's a little bit more parental, particularly all the important stuff I go through, make sure your gear is good. Uh, for people who don't have supply tagging all their equipment, it's doubly more important to make sure you your equipment is good at the beginning of shift. So some of the stationings that we do they get 
put out throughout the community, figure out where they're needed. All different types of systems and EMS systems will work and find different ways to properly have enough people to man and make the response times that they need to. So they usually on average run typically less being on scene for a 911 call in less than 10 minutes is usually somewhere around the national average and usually it's around 90% within that 10 minutes. Some areas will have different, depending on it's rural or local, and anything like that. Um, kind of have a few different rough timelines that they're trying to make and that they're trying to make the majority of the calls in, which is what we call compliance, right? And that's where we see, we always hear the, particularly on the private EMS side, hey, we are 90% c compliant, we are 91% compliant, which is they are doing well. Anything less than 90, in, particularly in our system, is they're not making that 10 or 11 minutes, whatever it is for the local where you're at, they're not making their times. So it's kind of what our compliance is. Trying to station the different stations themselves for those that have stations. Um, out in Arizona, we have a lot of stations. Here in Nevada, posting plans. But it's very similar to where the fire departments decide to put their stations. Usually it's easier to move an ambulance station usually than a fire department because there's usually a lot more bays apparatuses other equipment that's there depending on where that station is in the community some private ambulances have really elaborate stations and some have an ambulance parked outside where they can plug it in so there's a number of different ways you'll see or at least like some type of garage where they'll try and stash the ambulance so meds don't get too cold things like that all right safe ambulance operations Estimated 4,500 vehicle crashes involve ambulance courage year. In 2015, 28 fatalities in crashes involving occupied ambulances. This area over here should look familiar. Just go ahead and look out the window. And that is my ambulance at one point. So, some things that I like to ask questions about because we have such a high number of incidents involving an ambulance, safe operation is hugely important. Always you get things like TBI, head injuries, and people die. Horrible things all around. Usually, most agencies require some type of emergency driving course. EVOC is usually. I uh, know that's what AMR and Medical West do. I believe that's also what Community does. And typically, if you're driving for a fire department, you have to get checked off on that individual apparatus, or at least the apparatus type, before you can drive that. It all depends. Different departments have different regulations but the everyone needs to have some type of emergency vehicle driving course and as you can see you depending on what's all going on whether it's head-ons typically we'll see where most accidents happen if anyone could take a guess most likely intersections and usually have a right we didn't right away so we'll go in here but how we're responding things that we can kind of prevent in the safety response prevent all the things that we can do to try and make sure our equipment's good that we're good that we know what we're doing that we're being safe about it and that the culture we have seatbelts on and in the back or in the front I usually if I'm not doing much in the back I'll throw a seatbelt on particularly if we're on highway speeds I've been tossed around the back in an accident before, so I tend to do it when I was working with my nurses. They'd be in the back. I would give them the evil eye till they did jumped on. Don't always, if there's things to do, though, I'll get up and do those. Many of the new safety systems where you can actually connect yourself, have a seatbelt, lean over, and actually do patient care is not half bad. I've seen it in some ambulances. Many of them, though, it's not really practical. The events itself, things that they can try and do, uh, same things of distracted e the EMS driver, if it's fatigue, which is a huge thing, uh, I think all of us have been super tired still driving patients around wondering why we're doing what we're doing. That's why in the flight environment we have safety stand downs, uh, rest cycles, everything like that, because we want to try and make sure that we are all alert and able to properly care for our patients. Private EMS has does not necessarily have that very well. Uh, a couple of places like Optum has started implementing that some, but they're also IFT, so a little bit different there. And then post, just trying to deal with recognizing what we can do after the accident, how we can try and improve and get better. Uh, 
Uh, most of the EMS providers and patient departments are not restrained. So I rarely am. However, when I, if there's nothing to do, driving on the freeway, yeah, I'm gonna throw a seatbelt on. Um, I would recommend everyone else do. It's, trust me, my head says otherwise. So go ahead and it's when you're hitting the back and you're getting tossed around, you are now the projector on the back of an ambulance and there's a bunch of hard objects in there that you can hurt yourself on and or get if the, another vehicle roll or if you roll, another vehicle hits you hard enough and the compartment tends to fall apart sometimes, you will be ejected. It's a bad day. Just go ahead. I'm highly recommending seatbelting yourself. Love things. So talk about police escorts. Police escorts during an emergency response can many times be dangerous. Um, many times it happens because they'll see the police car go through and then the cars will start going again and don't see the ambulance coming right behind them. There's some exceptions to this, particularly if you ever see Metro and it's a Metro officer being shot, they will shut down the entire road, much like the president going through. They have all types of cars going ahead police vehicles shutting down intersections that's a little bit different than just following one or two vehicles in um, that's a little bit safer because they have the entire roadway shut down however if it's just one or two vehicles going ahead that is when accidents tend to happen more also goes true for having a because many of the private ambulances don't have the system to turn the lights I've had a rescue go ahead and lead one of the county's rescues go ahead so they can make sure the lights are switching for us and you got to be careful of that too because no one's expecting that second emergency vehicle so still got to be careful through the intersection so safe ambulance operations i uh, include poor poor road and weather conditions always big ones many times accidents happen on sunny clear days or nights not much is going on and they just don't see it particularly in our town because at night we have a lot of intoxicated people who are not paying nearly enough attention and they decide to T-bone you. So, and like this says right here, dry roads, clear weather, do not guarantee a safe response. Appropriate use of warning devices and signals. I know there's plenty of times I would turn off my sirens while in the middle of the night going through certain neighborhoods in certain areas of town because up in way north of Aliante up there many times, there's no traffic out there. However, most state laws everywhere say if you're going to be running lights, you need to be running sirens. So put a little bit at risk, but I didn't want to be obnoxious. Being said, kind of known situation in place. During the day, they're not going to see the lights. They're going to see, hear the sirens and when they do. So follow your local agency and state protocols as far as those go and use them. Remember, they're just a courtesy lettuce to get other people to please Many times, particularly in many nice cars, either you got your music really loud like I do normally in my car, or you got other vehicles that are just, they are very soundproof, you can't hear very much. It's nice with some of the sirens out there, it's really hard to ignore where you get the big old subwoofers and the bumpers and starts play a siren through there and it gets people's attention. Being said, we know people aren't th out there aren't paying very much attention. So. Make sure everyone's aware and that you're doing everything correctly. Uh, if, you've gone, if you haven't gone through an EVOC course or had this explained, just know that the reason that we, one, change up pay, the tone and the different sirens we use, some people get up there and play musical sirens. It's usually annoying. Sometimes it can be effective, though, if people are not paying attention. That change in tone helps people recognize that there's an emergency vehicle coming through. Another important thing there is the reason that we use the big long whales that comes and goes is because that travels longer distance. So as people hear it from way far off, and go, oh, cool, there's a I can hear the siren somewhere. I don't know exactly where it's coming from. As it gets closer, we change that to the the more woo 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 type sound. That sound has that shorter wavelength. It's doesn't go as far, but it gets people and it allows people to locate where the ambulance is coming. And then the chirp is kind of annoying, but I always like playing with that one too. But uh, it definitely lets them know right behind it. Very short sounding and sh sound waves very short, but make sure they're very obnoxious and you can hear them. So using proper siren tones, great. 
play a musical sirens with being a DJ up there. Not as great. Maybe too much annoying. Unless you're just someone's not paying attention or you're going to a very dangerous intersection, sometimes it's good to change it up. So, uh, as I was kind of mentioned earlier, between 43 and 53 percent of ambulance crashes in the United States occur at intersections where an ambulance proceeds against a red light. Uh, there's a picture earlier in this slideshow showing my ambulance exactly what happened. Pulling up, we were clearing the light. Another car was coming southbound. There was a car in the turning lane. I kept. We were clearing it. My driver looked right, looked left. As he looked right again, as he's slowly proceeding through the intersection, we got T-boned. Happens all the time. This is where many of those go. It's the importance of always having lights and sirens and driving carefully, particularly when you got your uh, another person in the back. As well as going against traffic. Some places don't go very, against traffic very much. In Vegas, it's like three times in one call. We do it all the time here. Uh, if you are, just make sure you're going safe there. Parking on the scene, it's really important. Use that big heavy engine to block that is, it's not just, oh, throw the fire department out there in front. No, that truck is very, very heavy, particularly when you start throwing water. If you're showing in city, most of the city engines, I believe, have anywhere between 500 and 750 gallons of water in their tank, not to not including all the equipment they have. If And we're talking about water, weighs about eight pounds each uh, per gallon, and you have 500 to 75 750 gallons in that truck that is a lot of extra weight that that much water itself is almost as much as some of these smaller cars weigh so by having those chalk blocks there set it up at an angle you're going to deflect that out yeah it's going to be a lot of pain dealing with the paperwork of having an engine hit a whole lot safer than having the back of your ambo crash string tube those ambulances tend to fall apart many times uh once they if they get hit hard enough they are not meant to withstand heavy impact Set the parking brake, guide the vehicle, make sure it's set there. As much as it's dumb to say, and we know our soups, oh, you don't have a backer. Just have someone out there so we don't cause an extra incident by us running over something or hitting something where now our ambulance can't transport. If our ambulance can't transport, it's nothing but a billboard of failure. We need to get out there. We need to make sure that we don't become part of the incident, particularly in bad accidents where you have pieces of car all over. It never looks great when your ambulance ran over a piece of metal that was there and then flattened the tire. Great way to park, as we can see, the engine right here, the truck, probably not, the truck's probably worth a mil and a half. So a ladder truck, uh, very expensive, still better than a people getting hit, but uh, engines still really rather expensive, but not nearly as much uh, either way. Go in there, set that nice angle. A car comes up here, hits it, bounces off into another area. And typically, depending on where it is, different area, if we can park, sometimes we'll park on the front, of, on the other side of the incident. Sometimes on the two-way highway, we don't really have a choice and we might have to just park right in front of that engine. It all kind of depends on the scene itself. You're gonna have to kind of size it up and figure out where you're best to park. Uh, it's a, remember, we're asking, for permission to have the, for everyone to get out of the way. It's not necessarily right for us. And we are still responsible because we are the ones who are going outside of the law within regulations to drive, to get to emergencies safely and speedily, but we need to make sure we're doing it safely. And it's still many times our fault if something happens. So here we go. Be safe when you lift. Uh, you don't want to be taken out early because you injured your back. There's a lot. To you will get, if you haven't got a good course on lifting a patient and lifting gurneys, your agency should provide that. If you have any questions, we can offer advice on like where it's best to do it. We don't do too much on gurney lifting or anything here in medic school. Most med classes do not. Uh, yes. Be careful. Always check her, particularly if we have any tubes, IV lines, anything like that when you're pulling out. Common sense, but make sure that lines don't get pulled out. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to 
play on the recording, but if not, we'll watch it in class. Bad day. I believe this person actually died. Anytime you have a fall like that, remember, they're gonna, many times they get head bleeds because they're not able to put their arms out. They're falling from six feet, and because of the motion of the gurney, it's going to swing down, and you have that increased speed, and they'll smack their head on the cement to develop a head bleed. Drop a patient when they have an impeller and you're transporting, like one of our one of flight crews did out at uh, Air Med, and that was a bad day. Impella broke. All right, now we're going to move on to aeromedical parts, and we're going to start, and we're going to go over some of this. Obviously, a little bit more exciting for me on here, and let's see as we kind of talk about. It. So, uh, aeromedical transport started back in Korean War, as you see here. Uh, obviously, not a lot of patient care doing, but the quick movement of injured troops from the battlefield or close to the battlefield, the front lines back to big, like Charlie Med, big other med medical facilities where they're actually able to do life-saving surgeries and care. So there's more than 300 air, more than 300 air medical service programs using fixed wing and or rotary wing aircraft in the United States. There's a few big companies that all run many of the small ones. There's a few independent ones out there and many of them like Guardian Air, who I used to work for, uh, they were, they are a, they vendor through one of the big agencies because safety you're going to, as we go through this is paramount importance and medical air medical transport because air medical transport by is relatively safe. However, when you add a bunch of unknowns of going to a accident scene in the middle of the night, uh, high stress anyways, lack of lights, everyone, a lot's going on. There tends and Everyone from the pilots to the medic and the nurses in the back and the medical crew, everyone wants to get out there and help someone. And so there many times they go out into situations that aren't necessarily ideal. Typically, if there's an accident in an ambulance, many times most people get away with just some injuries, occasional death. Typically when a helicopter goes down, not a lot of survivors. They definitely do. And there's I have a good story of one of those. Or it's not my story. Um, Native 15 had a medic who are the pilot and nurse died, medic somehow survived, former Marine stayed on the mountain, he came and talked to our class, very good dude down, Derek Bain down in uh, Arizona, harrowing story, and somehow he survived on the side of the mountain for eight plus hours waiting for their search crews to get there. Um, really interesting situation, but tend to be when helicopters go down, unless they're able to auto-rotate down safely due to something, usually rather catastrophic and not a lot of survivors, same as planes. Typically, I, there's usually one to two pilots, depending on the aircraft, whether it's fixed, rotor, whether it's IFR, which is instrument flight rules, or VFR, visual flight rules, single engine, double engine. There's a number of things. One to two pilots, though. And usually the medical crews consist of, on average, in the United States, it's a flight nurse and a flight medic. Some t places, even within the United States, can have dual medics. Some places in the California, they like dual nurses. But many times, a flight nurse and a flight medic make a really good combo between their two expertises. The On um, fixed wing stuff, there's a little bit more where they'll get RTs in there. You'll get, and then when you talk about some type of the specialty teams, they'll get neonate and sometimes you get docs in there too. So you get neonatologists, you get neonate nurses, and they have their own kind of specialty. They'll fly and fit rotors too, uh, but many times they're not running to scenes with those. So local EMS, many of them will develop the criteria for requesting air medical services and the process to go through there. Basically, you're gonna get on scene, you're gonna see, hey, do we need to take this patient? There's a number of things that can kind of go in, and many times, many of the evaluation is, is would it get be faster for us to take the patient by flight or by ground, particularly when you talk about traumas and we're really, or STEMIs, strokes, and we're dealing with distance and traffic. Sometimes it can only be like five miles away, but if we're talking about being out like 10 miles, let's say Blue Diamond, middle of the day, or middle of the afternoon where traffic's dead, it's going to take you 25 minutes to get to UMC versus a five minute flight. If you've got uh, Mercy 7 down by the M, takes off, flies three minutes, lands, picks up your patient, 
flies another six minutes, lands, all of a sudden you cut off a ton of time, particularly if you get them there earlier. Uh, many of the medical considerations is just, is it a sick patient? If you would take this patient and they're, it's time sensitive, that might be all you need. Um, some of the criteria that you send out looks almost exactly like what's on our trauma criteria list for trauma patients. Crazy how that works. And if we request air medical services in Arizona, we were able to do it all the time. I could get on the line. Hey, dispatch, can you go ahead and get a hold of Guardian Air, Native Air, Classic? Do they have any? Can we see if anyone's available? Can we get them on standby? If they're available to get on standby, there's a couple ones you can ask and go like, do you want on ground standby? Do you want to get them in air standby? I've said this in the past and I'll say it again a thousand times. If it's a rotor wing, we love scene calls. If you called us and then canceled us when you got on scene, you preemptively go, hey, traffic's really bad here. We want you to start getting in route before we're even on scene. So long as they're not getting there before you, depending on their, there's certain areas that we could, uh, certain areas in Guardian Air, we had, had like first responder status where we could land on a scene if we had, had a deep with a couple uh, regulations, make sure we had a safe landing zone and get there and we could actually operate as first responders versus waiting for someone else to make an LZ for us to land. Being said, you get on, you get us rolling, we're flying in the air and all of a sudden you go, ah, these aren't that bad. Uh, if you want to come by, you can stop or we're just going to cancel you. We're like, cool, we're going to go ahead and sit back and enjoy this nice helicopter ride in this afternoon instead of going to do another IFT. Down with that, call, get them lift. It, you, if you're worried about fuel, it's not that much fuel. The, the company will deal with it just fine. They want, everyone wants to go there and help us. So get us there. And then even if you get there, one thing most aer aeromedical transport companies don't transport is codes. Get there, you work on a code. There's, that's fine. I've gotten there, helped out, jumped. I've helped do the extrication process, got the patient out. Patient was coding. We worked the code. Ended up calling them on the scene, helped them clean up, and then left him wait for the corner and everyone else. And then we left. It's kind of nice. But on the other hand, we were there to help whatever they needed. So don't be, don't ever be afraid to call for air, particularly if there's any type of distance. If you're off like, if you're in the bowl, probably don't call for the helicopter. But other than that, yeah, don't be afraid to call and at least get an idea where they're coming. Because many times if all of a sudden they see that there's a scene call and there's the IFT that's not that important, they'll put that helicopter on standby, whether they lift off or not. And all that takes is flight crew getting up, getting a helicopter, standing by, pilot running through his checklist, um, ready to start up in case you need us. Or then we might get out the helicopter and you guys are like, ah, no, cancel. Or, hey, yeah, go ahead and get in route. Cool. We're going to go ahead and lift off now. No worries at all for to just get activated. The longest thing is some of the pre-planning. Typically, we have about a 10-minute response time, 10 to 15, depending day or night. And that, depending on what company you're calling, they might tell you what how long it'll get for them to get there, or they might tell you how long it is from that moment to when they'll be on scene. So with that being said, kind of listen to their wording and get used to what the local crews tell you guys, if they tell you anything. Um, Make sure they're getting out there. and But if you activate them sooner, the biggest part is get that initial activation. Once we're at the helipad, we're ready to go. And then if you activate us, we start taking off, and then you cancel us, no biggie. Even if we don't take off, ain't nothing to us. So middle of night, don't care. Call them. Direct ground. So another thing, we typically want some type of communication with someone on the ground. Sometimes it's not always ideal, particularly certain areas in Arizona. We just could not get a hold of them. Uh, being said, Arizona, we had things called like V-Fire 21, the mutual aid channels. There's usually something, and typically the air companies, if they can't find you on that mutual aid, they will get on your channel. They have most of the channels, and they'll reach out to you. We don't need a ton of information. Hey, where are you at? What's a basic patient status, patient weight? What do you have us for an LZ? And we'll talk about LZ stuff here in a minute. Uh, be situated around the perimeter of the LZ for lighted vehicles. White lights should be directed towards the center, but not at where the pilot's coming at. And we'll go into some of the smaller things. We just, at night, uh, remember the pilot and the crews are typically wearing NVGs, so night vision goggles. If you've never worn night vision goggles, when you get shined in light into it because it gathers a bunch of lights, it tends to blind you a little bit so we don't want to shine lights at please don't ever point a laser or anything like that at the uh, aircraft 
Flares should not be used uh, in most places because as you, the helicopter does land, has hurricane force winds, and it'll blow that flare out into the grass and catch fires. Not great. Uh, wet down dust DLZs, rather important. Just some general landing zone prep things that we can think about. And typically, the pilots won't land in something that's dangerous. Also, we'll get into it more that in the LZ class, but the pilots will put the helicopter down where they see safe. Uh, it might not be anything against you. It could be, but most likely not. Uh, might They just might see something from the air that they are not good with. Also, everything is on the pilot's uh, it's their responsibility for that aircraft. So if something goes wrong because you think you have the right area and they decide to land somewhere else because something they see, it's on them. If something bad happens, it's not on you or anything like that. So just don't take it personal. We had some issues with um, our pilots down in Yuma when I was with AeroCare there when they were landing out of Glamis, which is a dirt biking dunes area for those of you guys that don't know. And the California park rangers were, were, would throw down a flare and want us to land our helicopters directly on the flare. Besides flares and smoke causing all types, whether it's smoke or flares, depending days or night, one, it has a chance to get thrown and blown all over the place. And two, it can cause mess up the paint on an aircraft. And three, it's an incinerator device that you're landing a helicopter full of jet fuel on probably not the smartest idea so they would get all upset we wouldn't land directly on their flare or smoke and we didn't necessarily care because but it's californian so they were throwing all types of fit no big deal but just note that just because you have this beautiful area of things out and it could just be wind it could be anything else it could be something they see don't take personal offense uh, and uh, please if there's fire explosion still don't ask them to land there they might find a place to land nearby and if there's a fuel issue and situation needs to be taken care of but we can always remove and research uh resituate the helicopter all right we look at these you have to memorize all of these no matter what no um even myself and any of the flight crew members never memorized any of these it's a Thing. If you're not on an aircraft or doing something that you're typically dealing with, hel having to direct helicopters in smaller and tight, more tight spaces, this isn't something you're going to be worried about. Um, if you want to be aware of it and learn some, good on you. The pilot will most likely recognize it, but it's not expected of you, nor the flight crews. Take your precautions, clear the landing zone. We'll talk about the feet once again. We'll get into some of the details. A distance of, or how far off we want to be clear of the landing area, 100 to 200 feet is best. Make sure there's no things that can go flying, hats, anything like that, and just wait till the helicopter's landed. Once you're on the ground, here's good safety elbow. This is called the no-no place. Right here in the back, no-no. Typically on the side of the helicopter, I'll show you guys on the other one, uh, we had eagles and I would place myself right here because we'd load into this right area and no one would get past me. When we talk about helicopters, the part that you hear most of the time isn't the main rotor. You might hear it a little bit. It's a tiny rotor in the back called the tail rotor. And depending on what type of helicopter, the H-130s, which you see like Maverick fly and a couple of the other helicopter companies occasionally, AeroCare flies those. 
they have it with cut finish on it's a the tail rotors inside there it's safe but it's not as good for flying as much it it's fine but it doesn't have as it doesn't allow them to do as much maneuverability and other things that pilots talk about so that being said don't go back here this blue line no no place if we call it say post a guard here don't post a guard right by the tail rotor post it further back and i'll get into it later but i'm going to say it again so hopefully remember it you remember if you see anyone walk towards the back of this helicopter while this rotor is spinning and most of the time you can't see the blade you have full permission to tackle that person to make sure they don't otherwise they will be bifurcated they will be cut in half helicopter will be done it is horrible you absolutely i don't care if it's chief you might not tackle them that hard maybe some of you might tackle them right harder they don't go near the tail rotor life is it's huge please don't ever if you're here you're loading a patient getting two more again but you're loading the patient your hat flies off starts going there don't go chasing doesn't matter i don't care what it is hundred dollar bill don't go chasing ain't worth it uh when you normally approach depending on where the what type of helicopter it is uh 407s pilots here a stars pilots here i think the 109s that some of mercy flies are here h-130s pilots here either way you want to kind of come from this area and you want you don't approach so the pilot tells you to go forward this goes for a flight crew too we do not get within the main rotor blade until the pilot tells us to because he can also direct even when neutral when it's just spinning and no power is getting put to it he can pull the rotor blades up because technically the front part is usually the lowest part and you don't want a haircut here so wait till he's there he'll give you go ahead go ahead and walk in good most of the time however one of the most dangerous times around a helicopter is when the blades are still spinning but it's no longer spinning under any speed so it starts slowing down they will still move and they will clip you rather hard uh, even if they're going slow enough that you can walk uh my biggest things i would never walk underneath them if it was any faster than i was walking forward if i can see those blades and it was my speed i would walk forward as a crew member my pilots still get pissed off at me but it's fine i knew i could run outrun that house at that point um but you can't always see these blades they dip they go and when it's starting to slow down typically we have centrifugal force keeping those blades upright but as it starts slowing and losing momentum those blades start dipping and they like to give people haircuts if you're not paying attention so by haircuts and head cuts approach from this area pilot will tell you typically the pilot is a go-to one if the flight crew waves you in it's usually because the pilot said it's good remember pilot pic pilot in charge there's a reason spinning parts everywhere and you typically don't recover from an encounter with one moving fast so this is the back of a 407 or 407 so you can see the pilots right up here we have this nice safety bar that is structural that does not move and this is this isn't one of my helicopters this has a lot more extra space in here because we have too much equipment and this is pretty stripped out right now i think i have some pictures of mine all around here but here it is this will come out typically on the air methods one that's a little bit different right here this is oh, don't worry you're not going to manipulate this part Instead, this will kind of slide out load the patient in and they'll go as you can see the patient if they are any type of combative can reach over slap the pilot bad day for everybody so it, reasons why the flight crew might choose to electively intubate a patient even if it's not a combative because they took drugs or they're angry because they had a head injury or they're hypotensive or hypoxic they might we might decide or that flight crew might decide to intubate because of this reason um, they don't want the crew member or the patient sit up and slap and touch the pilot and like that there's a reason for it. it's also why you see we don't try to take birthing people in there because the pilot's gonna have to catch one-handed doesn't always bring a space buckle up so being said we can do some procedures we can tube in the back we can kind of do cpr not greatly and we can do some things most of the time we can throw a rider sitting backwards usually depending on the situation sometimes one of the crew members will sit backwards there's another seat right here in a 407 and uh but many times our, our jump bag was right here and we had all of our equipment in our jump bag and we didn't have very much equipment hanging from anywhere besides like our monitors and stuff so just some things to be aware of and they're going to brief everyone if it's going to be a hot load as in the blades are still spinning while we load them up the crew member will brief you if they do not don't go there and just free ball it like 
talk to make sure everyone's feeling safe when you go in there it's not that stressful it's just loud um being said if you're not used to it there's a number of things it can be a little bit intimidating which is why i always try to encourage our new hires as well as flight crew members to be underneath the blades see how it spins and it's not a big deal but you got to be used to it a little bit just because it's a lot of noise and a lot of things going on. Same way when we get into extrication, I try to get you guys inside a car where I cut open the car and you go, wow, it's really loud in here. Okay, I get it. That kind of same thing. So, yep, that was the first half. Uh, that's kind of the book stuff. I'm going to go much deeper into it here in a bit. And we're going to deep dive into a lot of the landing zone stuff that was just some of the basics i will give you a bunch more numbers and all the other things such as like landing zone sizes all day nights all the different things that you guys need to know as part of the second part so with that it's the end of the book material and i'm gonna make this two slides short so sweet all right guys so next we're gonna look at landing zone safety and everything that kind of take that goes along with landing zone calling for air, different things like that. Uh, some of these pictures are a little bit odd. I'm going to eventually replace some of them. I This was directly from our PR, so then some of the diagrams a little bit. Could use some work, and I'll get to it one day. So, starting off there. All right, guys, so this is actually the helicopter I flew in, 407 Golf Alpha or Angel 8. It is a 407 GX. It was the only GX we had in the fleet. Newest helicopter that we had. They were getting a couple other ones as they were expanding when I left, but this was still newer in the sense of when it was built. Uh, some quick things to point over when we look at a helicopter, particularly the 407. So one, tail rotor. Uh, there's any, I don't think I have any pictures of a 130 in here with a Fenestron, but basically this tail rotor spins so fast you cannot see it and you do not want to walk into it. It's going to be a bad day. Uh, this is typically where most of the sound comes from as well. This, the height of the main rotor blade is typically higher than you're going to be able to reach up and touch in a, if it's sitting still. If it's not in spinning wind, just the motion of them can cause them to move forward and back a little bit and give yourself a haircut along with everything else that's on your head and your head some other things you kind of look here here's the eagle that i had mentioned in the previous slideshow and this is where one this is a little cabinet or almost trunk space where we keep some of our gear our extra gear and it's not very large at all it makes the trunk seem spacious, but it allowed us to put some work here. And these doors actually double out and kind of move out open if you remember the other slideshow and it kind of opens up even more so. The patient goes right here, the pilot's right here on the right side. So if you're walking up, you typically, the pilot can see you from this angle, but it's better to come from that front right side. Typically as a medic, I like to always sit on the right here. Why? Because airway patient's head's right here. Nurse can kind of sit there and we had a backwards facing seat and nurse would sit either way. Some other things you can take quick note of. These things right here, they are called wire cutters on both below and after. Wire are a huge issue that we have to deal with in flight. You don't want to run into them. Uh, they're very bad as we, you can imagine a wire coming up here and then going right up into the blades. Now you don't have any blades and now you're falling through the sky and or you're wrapping yourself in them and it's a bad day for everybody right so those with if you're going fast enough they will cut through the majority of wires um it's still a bad day so we don't want to do that and it's why thing one thing i wanted to say make sure that we're looking out for wires when and when we're picking landing zones can it be avoided? yes but that helicopter if it hits wires is still gonna be grounded and it might be grounded permanently because it might end up on the ground facing the wrong way, but hopefully it'll survive. Sometimes it'll just clip it, and if it's small enough wire, it'll cut right through, and it'll be all right. Sometimes not. The other thing you can see right here, here's the skids. Interesting uh, about skid helicopters. So if it's a little bit muddy or snowy or sandy, uh, those can go in, and if it's uneven, all of a sudden the hel helicopter can tilt one way or the other, so it's good to have a nice 
firm ground that you're picking for a landing zone. Also, if it's muddy, sometimes the suction can get on and this helicopter tries to lift, only one side will lift and the other side won't, and all of a sudden that helicopter wants to roll over. Not a great day all around. In general, pretty relatively safe mode of transportation. Fantastic, uh, nice and quick. Goes about 120 to 140 knots, goes similar to miles an hour, somewhere right in there, and works great. So when you, remember to approach from, you want to stay in this front angle, or direct, and then if you're walking with the crew, walk right up to the side. Do never, don't approach the helicopter unless they wave to you. Most of the time, just wait till the flight crew gets out and comes, links up with you. That's going to be the best way to go about this. And they will link up with you, get you all the info, get you the information. And then if you're helping to load the patient in, they'll they'll brief you before we go in. So something guardian air is great. Uh, one of the f n uh, as far as not to promote other company, but it is a really good hospital based nonprofit company. Did things correctly majority of the time. I joy to work with. I love that company and still do. Good good people there. Um, it's a company like anyone else, though, and it still has its faults, but great o overall. So, kind of their background, they've been around for a while. They've actually had two accidents in their past. One was a fixed wing, and when they ran their own helicopter, or didn't have a helicopter, sent a plane, uh, really crappy weather, and ran it, and they shouldn't have flown. They had a number of issues came up, and it ended up running to the side of a mountain. The second one was a helicopter about 2008, right when I was getting out of the military, about a month before I actually got out. It and another helicopter, they were unable to communicate because they're coming around the mountains. The helicopter line, radios are line of sight typically from air to air. And as they're both coming in to Flagstaff to land at the hospital there, they weren't able to communicate with each other and end up running into each other. And everyone on all, everyone died from both crews. So that was classic in Guardian Air. And that was 2008. So they're a very safety conscious program, which is a good thing, kind of are in the hard way like many places do and so they have a little bit of history but they're a really good program and very progressive they have four they are uh, four specialties so they have adult pediatric high risk ob and neonatal care every crew member is neonatal trained but the neo team itself has all its specialty stuff so really cool stuff and the rest are all three specialty uh, to include medics and nurse uh, and the nurses so and they typically run nurse and medics and said Bell 407, oh, there's beautiful, I angle it again, 140 top speed knots, it'll go a little bit fast, you got a good tailwind, but they'll go 140 knots, close to like 125, 130 miles an hour, not that fast compared to a fixed wing, but it can land anywhere and at hospital, so you don't have to have that pesky ambulance right in between. Single patients that we can take, uh, ran, with the smallest exceptions, it's like if it's a newborn born out on scene, many times they'll put them so long as the baby doesn't need resuscitation, put the baby on the mom's chest, and we'll, we just go with it that way. If it was at a facility, we just wait for our Neo team to get there. I've done that right along capable. <clears throat> as we look through, we can see, um, I saw that one, but basically we can put both either a writer from the scene, like a parent, or you can do ride-alongs there, depending on how hot and cold that is. This is out in Sedona. This is somewhere on the reservation. Uh, Navajo Reservation does do well high altitude and those new HP engines and the other aircraft are really really well good uh, yeah and you can open up these windows because it's a non-pressurized aircraft pretty cool so they're no longer air methods they switched to a different company called Metro after 25 years uh, as much as medical has had a hard time filling spots pilots in the medical field are having even a harder time so um, they're but most companies kind of have the same one. Many have a military background. Some of them weren't pilots, but they got their pilot license afterwards and became pilots. But uh, a couple of my pilots, one was a former aviation special operation commander uh, out at Tuba City and another one who flew George W. Bush with Marine One. So he's some really good pilots, some really experienced pilots. They typically need 3,000 hours of flight experience, which is a lot of hours. And a fixed wing hours, it's not quite the set fixed wing, get up there, put it on autopilot, the cruise for a while, if you have it, and uh, rotor wing, it's a cons it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot more involved with flying a helicopter. Helicopters really, they don't so much as fly as beat the air into submission. So all of them are, there's a difference between instrument flight 
rating and visual flight rated, all of them are rated to fly instruments, but the all aircraft guardian air and most aircraft you see that's not usually in areas of really crappy weather, like up way up north in um, by Minnesota, areas like that, or anywhere along the coast, they get tons of fog. It's all visual flight rules because they typically only need one pilot and don't need a ton of it. So lighter aircraft, easier to maintain, cheaper to run versus dual pilot, dual engines, all these other things that are typically there. However, if the weather gets really crappy mid-flight, we call that double IMC, inadvertent instrumental meteorological conditions, and the pilots can fly by instruments only, which means they can't see anything outside, but they can they can look at their instruments. Here's just some of them, and uh, get to where they need to go, which is doesn't sound as big of a deal on a uh, fixed wing. Those tend to keep just flying straight so long as they got enough gas and lift and helicopters, not as much. So they all can, they usually, some of the best pilots I've flown with, great crew members. So here's a couple things on what is needed for Guardian Air Flight Medics. This is directly from the job site, which I just pulled off there. And this is an example of what most places need. Uh, they might need one or two extra things in Guardian Air, but typically this is the minimum requirements to do flight medicine. Minimal of high school diploma, GED, or a GED. And Arizona, because it's Arizona, but you need either your state and usually the National Registry paramedics. They, because they also pick up in other states, they prefer to have National Registry medic. It's easier to keep maintaining that. So if you're ever interested in flight and don't let your national drop, do things like the neonatal resuscitation program stable course, which you guys have gotten a, at least a taste of. TPHC, which is the equivalent, a little bit better, but eh, not too much different than PHTLS. I like it a little bit more. It gets more into a little bit critical care things, but overall, really good uh, course. And the medics and nurses go through the same course. They get a TNATC and trauma nurse advanced trauma uh, course. And within typically two years of hire, some companies will want six months, but Six months, two years to get your FPC. FPC, and this is rules that CANES, which certifies, not so much certify, certifies them to be able to do flight medicine, but it a lot, by saying that CANES certifies, it means they fall, they, much like our certification process for education, says that we do things correctly and we do things by certain standards that they set. So it's pretty important. And driver's license, because we drive to all the different bases. We actually got company cars, it was nice. We drive to Flagstaff, or if we live in Flagstaff, we drive to base, clock in, and then drive an hour, two hours to whatever base we would go at if we weren't stationed at the Flagstaff base. And there's only one or two crews you get to Flagstaff base. So, uh, experience, you're almost always going to need three years of experience as a paramedic. If you ever go to a place that does not need you to do two, three years experience as a paramedic, unless you have some weird exceptions going on, they are not going to be CANE certified, and I would not want to fly for them because there's other things that they're probably not doing safe. Uh, just stay away from there. Obviously, everywhere wants previous experience, but good luck. You got to start somewhere, right? Uh, and flight duty weight of less than 225. Reason for that is semi important in that helicopters are already running many times very close to what they can carry as patients. In the summertime at high altitudes, sometimes our helicopters would sit at the, we would have to lose 250 pounds of equipment, not including crew members, just to be able to take off. Most of the time, though, um, if you're a little bit heavier because they it's so close on weight, they would not be able to take certain patients or they'd not be able to have enough fuel to go where we're going. So it's kind of important to make sure that you would uh, wait. And depending on where you're at, sometimes the weight at the Flagstaff base itself, they prefer you to be down closer to 215 because it's 7,000 feet. Other bases, and I've seen out here, 225, 230 is usually pretty safe. And fixed wing does not usually have the same requirement. This is usually a base specific and platform like rotor platform, 407s, H130s, anything like that specific. Uh, and the rest is all there. Uh, physical assessments, not that. Flight nurse, just in case you want to go nurse side, smarter way to go. They get paid more for the same job, but we had the same exact scope. So they go three years of critical care ER experience. They want all the same certs, PALS, NRP, ACLS, CCRN, CFR and CCRN, and CEN. So certified, our critical care registered nurse and certified emergency nurse are no longer really being accepted by CAME. So it's all going to be CFRN. And then a trauma course, either PHCLS or TPATC. 
Minimum three years experience. Care of adult pediatric and maternal parents. Some uh, patients sometimes you'd see these. The NICU is completely different. They hire specifically NICU nurses sometimes, or there'll be four specialties, which they can do all four. Uh, associates nurse degree required for nurses, bachelor's preferred. You're going to see that more and more. And luckily, you guys will have associates in medics, so it makes you more hireable. Here's all the stuff that they'll help them get. Neonatal resuscitation programs not always given out. Hopefully, we'll see it more and more, but they do get you, they research you in the hiring process with everything. So, that being said, moving on. And then they'll get their CFR. In. So with that, they'll get all these. And same thing as medic. Mechanics, this is just what they do. Uh, from the air method side, they have their aircraft uh, license. They are trained on call 24 seven. Anytime we had an issue, they would be there. We had one mechanic per engine. Uh, all of our aircraft were single engine to include our fixed wing was a flautus, it's a great aircraft. But you'll see some aircraft out there that will have two engines, whether it be a rotor or a fixed, and they will have, they have to have one mechanic per there. And they tend to do a ton of work. Great guys. Love them. This is our dispatch center. It looks very similar to what you'd see up in dispatch there. We got a lot of people. I don't think, yeah, one of those is still working there. I think she's in charge still now. Um, we need to call. They can. We. They would take your call. They'd coordinate things and whatever GPS they get, you give them. They were able to get it trans uh, and get it to what our pilots needed. So whether it was your GPS off your phone, just a eight digit there, magnetic map, whatever way they could kind of get, they would get there. If anything else, they could get some rough cross roads out there in the middle of nowhere, and they could get us close. So long as there's somewhere. Uh, truck or someone to get us in many times we would have to fly around looking for the flashing lights to find these people but they got us close not on them so skills that we had rsi vent management cracker thoracotomies need needle surgical we also have finger thoracotomies where we would make that incision in the chest with a scalpel open it up pretty much cracking the chest in a not crazy way like you do at umc but in a smaller way works fantastic we didn't do chest tubes there some place to do yeah, no one cares about combi tubes. Hello, maze, bougie. Yeah, all this. We had CMAC uh, video laryngoscopes. Fantastic. Surgical thoracotomy, as I just said. I... Uh, Tony, he's actually the... He's a chief medic there, and he does a lot of the outreach. So, uh, great guy. Just got another one. She's awesome. Went to Camp Verde base. This is how much room's kind of in the back, and you can see. Uh, Tony's a very s short guy. He's... A lot shorter than I am, just saying a lot. And uh, you can see how he, with him, his space in there, it gets really crowded soon. That looks like a pediatric, a bigger pediatric, but there, right? And so a lot of a lot of work goes all through here. Um, they had we have a ton of resources in there, and this is without the new vents and everything, which take up even more space. So there's a lot going on in here. We have a ton of meds, a lot of our meds and pre-made drips back here. We have all our airway stuff back here, fluid warmer, all types of cool stuff in here. And uh, we run out of space real quick. This is why we'll try and do some of the care on the ground if we can. Or if you guys get work done, start IVs, do things so we don't have to spend time on scene to do it or have to try and do it in this tiny little aircraft. There's very little to no room to do CPR. It's rough. So criteria for, for flight. If you think they need to go, call but in general, things that we're looking for, oh, there'll be some guidelines in here, but man, it's, if they look shocky, if they look like they need trauma, if they look like they need uh, stroke, uh, stimmy and like that, and time is of the essence, call. He said, don't be afraid to call. If nothing else, we're getting a free flight and you can cancel us along the way. And if not, and it's an easy click patient, no biggie. You can chart it, go home. Scene calls are great. It's a nice change of pace from IFT. There's a lot of IFTs in flight. Um, and that's where a lot of the interesting critical care side comes from. You're dealing with really critically sick patients. It's not a boring IFT usually with flight. That usually um, does happen. So other criteria. This is, just look at your trauma stuff. If it qualifies for trauma or it qualifies for going to a LBO or a STEMI center, they probably need flight if it's far enough. Oh, they, all these are the same stuff, guys. So things that we looked at. This is literally just on the criteria that they uh, they'll give you a number if for private ambulances you guys can call typically if it's close to the city and the fire department's responding it many of the fire captains and all that will go through there however if you guys think you need it you guys can absolutely activate them 
and get those guys rolling. If you're going up to Mawapa, Indian Spring, Indian Wells, I get anywhere far out there, usually county, uh, even the rescue units are really good at getting fire there and getting them to a location they need to. Sometimes it's landing at the airport and that is absolutely appropriate. Uh, things to, one other thing. So things to let them know how many patients you guys have because they might need to send multiple helicopters. There's typically in the region, I'd say within six hours, I don't know, two, five, ten different helicopters depending on status and if they're transporting in this area. Being said, typically a five to ten minute launch, sometimes you have to add five extra minutes and each base is a little bit different depending on how close their quarters is to the helipad. I had about a four minute quick walk down the street to our helipad so we had a couple extra minutes there at night usually because we're actually sometimes sleeping. Um, they give us a couple extra minutes to respond to that but the sooner you guys get us activated and you're on standby the sooner if you go hey we might have this uh, just can you guys are you guys available they'll status check the pilot see if everything's good like yeah we can take it and then hey go ahead and stand by we'll get at the helicopter or in air standby get us flying if anything we'll orbit above you guys and if you guys go yeah no we're good we'll bounce out and if not yo we'll land and do work uh things that will cause them to say no weather 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 um, these clouds yeah it's close to a thousand feet ceiling it's kind of hard to tell they usually won't fly with low clouds, heavy cloud cover, depending on it. Depending on where you're at, too, in the length of flight, right? If you, if it's kind of crappy weather, but it's a short flight, they might be like, cool, we can avoid it. If it's a long flight and there's thunder, cloud, lightning, all that, they might say no. Um, fog, usually no go. Usually not too worried about that. Heavy, high winds, yep. Uh, so lightning or connective activity and things like that. High winds, because as you're trying to land, you don't want the helicopter to be getting pushed the wrong way and into the ground. So... Uh, they might say no, they can't do to weather. We had a, at Guardian Air, we had a policy that we, if we can get the crew there, we would. Not necessarily if we had to leave, because if we could get there, usually we bring that critical care aspect, and we can bring a critical care team and all of our equipment there, and we can help you through that situation. So don't be afraid to call, and we, and then if we needed to, if we could lift, we would lift, and if not, we'd ride in with you, and we'd do what we could. Sometimes just having that extra expertise when you're out there by yourself, huge help. So establishing LZ, we look at here. What do we see? Big empty ways. Does it look like the roadway's closed down? Unable to tell. It look doesn't see any active traffic. Question is, where would we land? Would we want to land on the side? Would we? You got to be careful on embankments, but still, we don't always like landing on the highway because people like to drive by and then hit the helicopters. Then that highway's closed down for a while. Uh, this is, I'm willing to bet, I-40. Could be I-17. I'm going to call I-40. That's a huge freeway that all of a sudden have to shut down. So sometimes landing in the center, usually right off to the side is typically best. But then we got to worry about fences. I do looks like there's a fence line running right here. So this is a view you get from the top when we're looking at places to land. You might have this great area that go right here in the middle, and there could be some reason that the pilot doesn't want to land there. And it could just be because of the wind. Um, you might be like, ah, oh, we want you to land over here, but it might not be big enough. There's a number of reasons, but if you guys, we'll, we'll look at where you're trying to have us land, and some of it could just be due to weather and wind and the reason that we couldn't do it due to the approach. Uh, we cannot see power lines. I'll get into that here in a bit very well at all. We try to, but it can be difficult to see. So biggest thing, we want to communicate. We want to be safe. We want everyone safe. You, us, everybody. How big does LZ need to be? As big as we can get it, right? Uh, typically, under 500 feet is minimally during the day. Bigger the better, clear power lines, tall brush, trees, trash. And once again, the pilot will say, yes, I'm going to land there. Hey, we're going to move a little bit further down. We're going to go. So here is a basketball court, and this is how big we need to, it should be to land. However, helicopter is not that big. And we had a basketball court that was a pre-designated landing spot out on the reservation where we would put it in like a half basketball court and we could land it right here, zero problem. These pilots are good and they can get them down, but typically as an LZ all around, we there wasn't anything else around that basketball court for us to run into besides the hoop, so we just made sure to land in the middle. But we usually need about 100 by 100 foot clear feet, uh, space. At night, 150 by 150. Bigger the better, do not point car leaks directly in front of the aircraft. Or the aircraft's coming, you want it facing, 
we want the landing zone decently well lit, but we have landing lights on there and we can light up pretty well. What we, some things that can be beneficial though is if you guys identify towers, cell phone towers, radio towers, um, telephone lines, anything like that, please let them know. And sometimes you can shine a light at that. Just make sure you're not shining a light into the pilot's face. They're wearing NVGs, it's very bright and it can cause them to get disorientated. You don't want that when you're coming in for a landing. Um, flares are okay. However, they can be blown into the brush and cause a fire. Once again, pilot will go. Uh, flashing lights work great uh, to identify the scene. We might ask you to turn them off. That is, do so, not a big deal. Just, hey, it's a little bit bright. Uh, one interesting thing is LED lights do not show up under NVG. So we'll be looking through NVGs, trying to find a spot. And if you guys are all LED'd up, where is the spot? And then we'll look underneath our NV night vision goggles and be like, oh, I see them right over there. I can't see it next. It's weird. So just know LED lights do not typically show up on uh, NVG. So sometimes it's a thing. Just as a heads up. Uh, first thing you should see, depending on if it's a crew that you've ran with before, or they've been in this area, or if it's a known LZ, like you're showing up to one where that's a pre-designated LZ, they might not do the two ones. They might just do a low recon pass and then find their spot to land. But typically, what they'll do is they'll do a high recon. They'll be looking around, making sure area looks great then they're going to do a lower recon see if they identify any further dangers before coming in and trying to get an idea of how the wind's acting at the different elevations just because the wind's blowing one way down at the ground level does it will change directions a little bit higher up sometimes that's how actually uh, the helicopter crashed a few years back in the canyon is the wind changed as it went down and it caught that helicopter and spun it all right it wasn't great decision making by the pilot but that was one of the reasons uh, the wind changing as he was lowering so sometimes we can see more up there on the other hand you also saw we have a limited vision you go hey i noticed you can also tell the pilot hey i saw that area over there just be aware there's some power lines you guys might not see going through them we're like oh good idea uh thanks for letting us know yeah maybe we will make an adjustment uh, once again sometimes we just see things like oh this will be better and the pilot knows best usually right you guys see a different viewpoint on the ground as we see in the air uh, if you need to communicate that, great. And no feelings hurt. It's just trying to make get do everything safely, guys. Uh, next, uh, level as possible, no more than five degrees recommended. Not a huge distance, and the reason being because, and the pilot will try to get. Sometimes he'll land one way and then rotate the helicopter. Do not come till he's on the ground, because we don't want to load. Particularly if this is a 407, so some of these drones are a little bit on the rough side, guys. But uh, some of the, the 407, we load the patient this way. We do not want to be loading a spending helicopter on this side. Many times we're just, we'll have the pilot shut down. It's only a five minute cool down and warm up cycle. Seems like, oh, 10 minutes. That's been on a long time. Usually by the time we get patient report, patient package ready for us, even if we don't have to innovate or do anything else, <laughs> 10 minutes is cutting it close. So if we can think we can load and go quickly, we'll keep it spinning, but many times we'll just shut it down. This looks like a flat surface. This is up on San Francisco Peaks. It's been landed at, you can see the angle of the blade of the rotors. It's actually on the, this looks like the funny slope area, uh, where they're loading this patient up and it's a bit of an angle. Pilot can get it down just fine, but then you see the natural tilt of the hillside right there. And the helicopters shut down right here, probably for one of these, because of that reason. So if there's any danger, or any reason that we, that they don't, like there could be any difficulties loading or complications, they're just going to shut it down. It's not adding too much extra time. And usually at that time, as a pilot starting to spin up, that's the crew members starting drips, doing other things that we can do in the back, and uh, no big deal. So obstruction to look for, stumps, bushes, tall grass, hidden holes and ditches. We don't want to put uh, soft spots in the ground, R rocks, hidden logs. It seems dumb, but all of a sudden that skid lands on one and it lands all awkward. If it's a big enough angle already, it can cause the entire helicopter to tilt. So other things, electrical poles, wires, fence, mile markers, loose wires, road signs, anything that seems super obvious from the ground, but when you're looking straight up and down, it's like less than an inch. Yeah, that's really hard to see from 100 feet away. Uh, thorough check of the area is required. Obstruction can be marked. I've already brought to the attention of the pilot. If you have chem lights, light that up. Be like, hey, here's an obstruction. We, threw a we have a chem light attached to it, like a fence, anything like that. And if not, sometimes shining a light, you can let them know, hey, we're going to shine a light on this tall tree pole, whatever else out there. If you guys need us to turn it off, move it, go ahead and let us know and we will, things like that. All right, guys. Uh, remove and, or secure all loose objects in the LZ. Remember, we're coming down with hurricane force winds and 
particularly right as they go to land, and it throws everything. Um, don't be surprised. It'll if you don't have your helmet, your fire helmet, or whatever else strapped on, it'll pick that up and toss it. So be aware. Ambulance doors, it'll slam those shut. Be careful. Farm animals. Um, horses are really expensive. One of our aircraft way back in the day ran into a horse right outside the hospital I worked at. It was it was not great all around. Yeah. So another thing, rotor wash can be super strong. Again, gale and even hurricane force winds. Also, this is what they call a brownout. Luckily, it kind of pushed out, and the pilots should be able to see the ground. If they can't, they will take off and do around. There's some things they can do too, or white out with snow. They can the way they can come in is try and use the force of that helicopter as they come to land and trying to push some of that air out. They'll see the ground and get it down. If they can't, they'll do a go around. If any time you see them coming in, and something seems unsafe, get on the radio, go around, go around, go around. No one care. As flight crew members, we had the, we were able to, and the pilot was like, "Cool, he's gonna pull power, he's gonna lift, and he's gonna go, and they're gonna do a go around." It's not a big deal, um, even if it or it can be life saving. And even if there is some type of you you went to go see something and nothing was there, like oh, I just thought I saw something there. I was being, no one's gonna care. Everyone wants to get home safe. No one wants a helicopter crash. All right, so like if you need to get on the radio and go go around, go around, go around, absolutely do it. Um, like they'll ask, hey, what would you see or anything like that? But you, it's something that we all do. So. Wind direction and helicopter approach. Like I said, uh, helicopters don't land with the wind. So for the tailwind, they're going to come the other way. They want to land into the wind. Hence why they're going to ask you, hey, what's the wind direction coming from? If Even if that's an angle, they can do a crosswind. They will not land with the tail rotor into the wind. It's a huge issue, and it'll cause a helicopter crash, right? So uh, once that, so how a helicopter goes, normally that rotor's spinning, right? The tail rotor, it causes Otherwise, if there's no tail rotor, the helicopter, the whole body of the helicopter will spin, right? So that tail rotor keeps the entire helicopter from spinning. Um, if the, you have a tailwind while trying to land, just trying to land, if you're mid-flight, it just makes you go faster. But while trying to land, because all of a sudden you don't have that forward direction going anywhere, it'll cause them to lose control and they'll spin out and crash. Hence why wind direction is hugely important if you know. If you don't, if you can give general directions, fantastic. Um, it's coming from the east. It's coming from where the sun's setting, where the sun's rising. We think it's coming from the north. Cool. They, that'll help out tremendously. This is an interesting one, right? You're coming down. You have high tension power lines. Tall building over here. Which direction do we go? Oh, we don't. If you, that'll be kind of a steep one. You can still possibly go up and then come straight down. Usually helicopters, just depending on weather and otherwise, they want to still try and land kind of at as it's descending and not just straight up and down. If it's Decent enough weather they can, but depending on the wind, sometimes it, the best idea might just be coming from this direction and dealing with a crosswind, possibly. Uh, the more information you get to the pilot, the better decision he can make on wires, wires, wires. Super important to be aware of them. Kind of easy. Like, yeah, I can see the wires, can't you? Can you see all the wires in here? There's something like 83 plus wires in this scene, and you can see the crashed helicopter that didn't see them. You have all the guide wires coming down, right? You have this power line. Trying to see there, and yeah, this is slightly, uh, not, not slightly blurry, but power like lines are really hard to see, and they can wreck a helicopter, real quick. So this might be your view from the ground. This is it from there. You're dealing with inch or two wires, like it's really hard to see from a couple hundred feet away. And person on in LZ kind of waving where you need them to go, particularly if you don't have great radio comms. Traffic cones, they can get blown around. Never use like sheets or fire coats just laying there. It's going to get blown away. Headlights can work instead of cones. LZ lights and kits are available. Um, those kind of guys up on those uh, reserve areas or the volunteer areas, they actually are really good at this. So, so they tend to be a lot better than the guys that work in the city because you don't call for flight that much. Um, don't flash right at the helicopter. Red flashers and strobes tend to not affect a, a night vision that very very much at all. Hence, like in old movies, like submarine movies, all the lights go red. It's because red doesn't wash out the – I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but the type of – that allows us to use our – rods instead of our cones which allows us to see in dark so it doesn't wash out the chemical that's in there and red lights are great 
for us to identify things without like completely ruining the night vision. So something to think about. All right, what red and blues, whatever you got going on, it's just fine. Just note they might ask you to turn some of them down. Sometimes some of the trucks out there are, have lights everywhere, and they might ask you to shut some of them down. Road flares, great, but they can start fires. Good thing there's not a whole lot to burn in Nevada unless you're up by like Mount Charles. So here's an idea. So helicopters coming in, they're coming in from this direction. So ha try not to have like have the scene well lit with your headlights without having shining the lights in their eyes. The pilot might ask a certain vehicle to turn their lights down or off, and that's just because his approach might be different, right? Really minimal illuminations can, can be used. Like they have NVGs, night vision goggles. They have landing lights. They got all types of lights. They can usually make it work, but extra ones work. So just note that they might ask you to turn down lights or hey, yeah, do you want to make it well, more well lit? This is a fantastic drawing. I don't know why it's still here. I'll fix it one day. I didn't do any of these. So you can see. This might be one where they ask you to with NVGs, but cool. So brownouts. There's another helicopter in this picture. You can't necessarily see it, but it's hidden over here. Brownouts. Brownouts can be dangerous. Uh, and so can mud can get slung, ice, snow, hard pack's not as bad. Uh, fresh snow can be a hassle and cause a whiteout. Hose down dusty areas. Let those fire county engines get to work and spray down that dirt. Uh, can it help out a ton? Don't make it muddy, but just spray down the dust. Really. Who gives a brief? Everyone should be kind of aware that helicopters coming in and um, information that needs to be included. So these are some the action medical service out of Winslow. Uh, and ain't most likely that's probably gonna be for like for seven and eight. Uh, sorry. Site selection security. LZ brief to aircraft. LZ checklist. Ensure correct radio frequency to be given to dispatch. If anything else, tell them what radio dispatcher what they're on, and if any if they for some reason the helicopter does not have it, they'll tr probably try and find a mutual aid channel for, to guys link up with. Uh, FAO in around the Vegas area is really good at identifying that, and most of the places they know like, hey, we're gonna go ahead and connect you guys. FAO is solid. Uh, there's spots in Arizona where we're just trying to talk to each other whatever way we can because it's out in the middle. Of All right. LZ brief, general description. Hey, it's a flat area to the north of the uh, I-40 and you're gonna see engine 23. Oh, if you haven't noticed, all of our ambulances and fire engines usually have some type of designation on the top of their ambulance or engine or truck rescue um, for that reason or police cars, right? So they can go, hey, I see the state trooper police car 321. Yeah, we see that. Yeah, you're gonna land right in front of that. Cool, sounds great. Um, size, it's about 100 by 100 or 150, 100 by 150, right? Any obstacles? We got a power line off to the south of the road and a fence to the north about 100 feet off the road, something like that. Wind, wind's coming from the northeast. LZ markings, we have it marked. It's going to be in between the two engines or whatever else. Uh, location in relation to the instant site, it's going to be about 50 yards away from there, meters, whatever way you want to go, we can all turn. Something an example might be this is engine 60, engine 8, six minutes out, request an LC brief and patient update. Uh, try to get a rough estimate of their weight just so we can see. Uh, on occasion, the medic might be left behind because technically a nurse is a higher level of care, particularly in Arizona. And uh, if someone's going to get left, usually it's a medic, usually. And But knowing the weight, and then we'll see if we can take off with it. So, uh, Angel 8, you'll be, this is would be from the engine 60. Angel 8, you'll be landing in an elementary school parking lot just located just west of the accident scene. LZ's flat paved surface, 300 feet by 300 feet. There are power lines, 70 feet high along the east side of the LZ. That is a great one, guys. If you don't, just get what you can. If they need to get any further information, the flight crew's really good at talking and getting the, whether it's a pilot or you use a medic in the back. I, I was usually on the radio trying to get any information because I'm talking medic to medic nurses. Can especially experienced flight nurses, but sometimes they're not. They got nurses things to think about. So either way, uh, they'll talk to you. And they'll get the information. They need. Also, flagpole. Yep, flagpoles are good. LZ even marked four lights and strong wind from. Ooh. If you're saying, "Hey, we are off to your six o'clock," make sure it's as best as you can tell from the nose of the aircraft. Hey, we are to your nine o'clock. 
So then they're gonna go, oh, cool. From nine o'clock from those aircraft, we see, oh, we see the scene now. Sometimes it's really hard to see from way high up. Yeah, that's a problem. You guys know what you're doing. Okay. Uh, landed from the engine. Yeah, there's a ton of engines where we're gonna land. Cool. So that's why giving good descriptors is better. Hey, there's engine 23, it's gonna be the one right next to the, whatever. A more descriptive line sometimes might be helpful. Uh, SCBA and charge line are not required. Must be ready to move quickly in case a crash happens away from LZ. Uh, we don't need that. It's not a... Sometimes you'll see it different areas that they'll have a things ready. We didn't need that at all, and most places don't use it. Pedestrian auto traffic stop. Keep public back 200 feet. Watch the public. They get real dumb around helicopters. We all like to look at helicopters. Uh, there's people in the public that try to ride bikes through a scene and almost run into tailors. That's a detailed answer because it almost happened. It he ran through he rode his bike through the scene, but almost into the tail of the river. So keep fire rescue back about 100 feet. Please don't ever drive an ambulance underneath the rotor blades. If you even if the rotor blades are stopped and you happen to nick that rotor, it's done. It's sitting wherever it's at and it's not lifting off until mechanic either comes and clears it or they change those rotor blades. That is not an easy job. It's a, just please don't do that. It's a bad day all around. So uh, if you have any questions, be on the safe side, park further away. We can walk, everyone can walk a little bit further. No one's worried about it. This includes at the airport, by the way. You happen to pick up from there. A person towards after the aircraft. So we call these the tail rotor guard. No one approaches that. Feel free to tackle whoever it is. If it's Chief walking right up towards that tail rotor, tackle him. Probably not tackle as hard unless you, like I said earlier, maybe tackle harder if that's, that's your strength. Um, no, otherwise they'll die. You don't want that, guys. And if you're a tail rotor guard, don't be right next to the tail rotor. Be about 50 to 100 feet off. But if they start going, you want to be on comms too and just go shut. If you tell the pilot to shut down, he can emergency shut down and throw those brakes on. If he does, it's going to need mechanic work. They have to come clear it, but he can shut the he can throw the brakes on the rotors and it will stop that pretty quickly. If someone's running towards there and they need to do that, uh, the pilot cannot see to the rear out of the majority of our aircraft. The exception would be Angel Eight, the one we had because it had a little camera going out the backside and the pilot could when they're lit. Well, technically you could pull it up anytime, but usually he would turn it on when uh, we were landed when he wanted to watch the tail rotor while it was running hot, particularly if the crew's out doing. We get a flight crew member as soon as we landed and there's a scene with a lot of people. I would jump out and just stand right by that door and I'd stay on comms and I'd make sure no one was coming towards our helicopter, particularly the tail rotor. It's like a moth to light. Uh, we'll be at direction flight crew. They'll let you know how they want to do it. Approach area. Now they might tell you to kind of go whichever way. Once again, that little eagle on this, this is not even any type. That's usually the stopping point. Do not go past those skids. If it's wheeled, uh, some of the aircraft Mercy Flies have wheels on it. Same thing, those back wheels. Don't go past it. Bad day. No. Don't go where the tail boom's at. Please. See those eagles? 406. Um, only those requested will come. We usually try to minimize it, particularly if it's a hot offload, just so we span the control. We don't lose too many people. Think the more people that are around happens. Now, if it's a, I mean, even you guys end up canceling, um, patient codes dies, no one ends up transporting. We'll walk you around the helicopter, no biggie there. But if the helicopter's running, we don't want too many people there. Just as makes sense. Sheets need to be tucked in, tightened. IV poles down. Yes, the you're gonna have to try and jump. I can't touch, I have to jump up and I might be able to touch those rotors if they're not moving. Wind starts coming, those things start moving, uh, up and down they start swaying particularly if that rotor blade is not at full speed that centrifugal force is no longer keeping them nice up and straight they have bend they will bend down and wind will cause them to move up and down so stay lowish you don't have to completely duck your head i still kind of bend my neck down and i know the blades coming down to hit my short head but still be cautious particularly if there's any type of wind it's very 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 loud um we might have to yell most of the time we're going to tell you what's kind of going on we're going to be communicating via hand signals if we need to. I yell, but you're not going to hear a whole lot. There's a lot of noise on running helicopter. It's obviously not a running helicopter, but you see the rescues are back. You see them loading the patient in, kind of getting in. I'm just tactical motivator here. And getting in, load them in. 
Mega Movers are great throwing them on here. Well, if uh, many times we'll trade you out of Mega Mover if you want to. If you guys have a bunch, no worries. But just so we do, we'll put, you notice IV pulls it down. We'll put the IV pull on them. Get the patient in there, right? Um, just follow the direction of flight crew. Going in, helicopter, you need your helmet. If you have your helmet, make sure it's strapped though. You don't want it blown off. If something flies, do not get it. Do you also see the medic right here? Medic is making sure no one goes past him. That's exactly why he's where he is. Those are old vessels, so our new vessels are way better. However, don't need all that. So as many people we will get, as, sometimes we might need a bunch. And if it's a big old patient that we're going to have a hard time getting in there, we will absolutely um, just shut down and do it safely. Uh, you can also see how that extra side door swings out like that. Don't worry about doors. We'll take care of them. Usually, we'll walk the uh, medic or whoever else, might be nurse. We'll walk you back outside the rotor blades, uh, and then he'll head back to the helicopter. Or they'll head back to the helicopter and suck up on you. I'm sorry. I am. Um, sometimes I might be. Are you good? I'm, see you kind of going. All right, I'm gonna finish packaging. Depending on the crew, I might have a little bit more. Hey, yeah, no, you're good. I've I'm trained you guys. You're gonna see them uh, carabiners everywhere. I don't know who that is, but some of our people. Do. And just see how we're not supposed to transport any type of hazmat, so decon them prior to getting them in a helicopter. Helicopters are so much more of a pain in the butt to decon than a ambulance. Ambulances in the back are relatively made to just be scrubbed, cleaned out. Helicopters are not, even when we add all the medical stuff in there. Sometimes they have to take the helicopter part of decon to include blood. It's a pretty decent story I'll talk about in class. And we do not carry protective or breathe, protective gear, breathing apparatuses. We've got N95s at best. Or we do, but that's about all we have. LZ should be located at least one mile upwind from explosive poisons, gas, chemicals, and dangers of exploding. We don't want – helicopters are safe when they're flying in the sky away from everything else. As soon as they land, they are now in danger. If there's riots going on, we – nope, get me out of there. Uh, or more in danger because of helicopter. That helicopter, people do dumb things on them. Don't forget guns, ammunition, and chemical mate. Nothing pressurized, guys. Pressurized containers can ex because pressure changes upon elevation. They can explode. You do not want pepper spray to explode in the helicopter. Uh, it's happened before, and the pilot's barely gotten down safely. It's a bad day. So hairspray, anything like that we might ask to go through the, uh, their stuff real quick. Make sure there's no pressurized things. Guns, not anything like that. They'll be handed off to law enforcement. The only people who can carry is law enforcement if we're transporting a police officer or it's a prisoner and the police officer's coming, if we can take them. And they are allowed to have firearms, but if it's a trauma, if the police officer has been shot, injured, car accident, anything like that, we'll actually we'll usually take the weapon away because if they become hypoxic, we don't want them losing their mind and going off that. So law enforcement are allowed to have it, but that's about it, guys. Uh, we'll hand it off to whatever law enforcement officer is there. That's casualty incident. Just let us know what we have. We're going to come in. We had a policy where the medic, uh, because we did a lot of ICS training, depending on which medic it was, uh, we'd get out. And sometimes the medic, because there's only one or one medic, a couple BLS crews out already on the ground, and no type of ICS um, chain of command, we take IC. We medic would help uh, triage, take over IC till someone else got there, and they'd send the nurse or the patient by themselves, and the medic would stay IC. The helicopter would come back, pick them up later. So that could be. So you're probably not going to see that around here, but if you go out to Arizona, particularly out in the middle of the reservation areas, that might be something that they do. It's a pretty interesting thing, and it's why we did a lot of training with the local EMS crews. That being said, uh, if it's just an MCI, many times the best – if you need extra people on the ground, maybe that medic can stay there and help. Remember, there tend to be more experienced medics, and they can help out more. Sometimes it might – there, but in general, they're more of the transporting – Type. So you want to get the – if you have enough personnel on the scene and you have a bunch of bodies, uh, have whatever patient you're ready to go tend to get our reds out of there first and load them up, get them transported, and get the helicopter out of there. Because I've been on scenes where you have five or six different helicopters coming in and going. you got some orbiting. There's some coordination going on. A lot of the coordination is being taken care of in between the pilots. They're, ha they're some of the best people on the radio I've ever heard. They have very good radio communication. Being said, there might be need to be something, someone there that's helping – Coordinate who's coming in and landing. Minimal time on ground. The most it, 
This is one where the crew on the ground is probably not going to do a whole lot. On the ground, they're going to load on the helicopter and do what they need to do there. But an IV would be nice. If not, we'll drill. So just be aware. Let us let them know what's going on. If you have other helicopters coming in and they don't know, let them know. Hey, uh, we have like three other helicopters in, uh, in route. Have you talked to them? Cool. Great. Thank you. All right, guys. That was it real quick. Love Captain Morgan on top of this, guys. And a full MGD. Classic reservation. Res, res runner right there. All right, guys. Um, if you don't have any further questions, we will go over the rest in class. Hope you have a great day.